Welcome everybody to another screencast. Our topic today is American imperialism. You can see here we're going to be talking about the Philippines, Alaska, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Hawaii in a major election, 1896, and then also 1900. You can see here in the bottom left, what we're going to start to do by 1898 is really expand the wings of the uh, bald eagle, our symbol of freedom, across into the uh, South Pacific. So our learning outcomes for today, you should be able to describe the three factors that fueled American imperialism, compare the governments of Puerto Rico and the Philippines, explain what it means for a country to be a protectorate, and understand why China is known as the sick man of Asia. So our beginnings. Pre-Civil War, we have the Louisiana Purchase. Again, a uh, little recap on that. Keeping Europe out of our backyard. Remember, we bought that from the French. And we also, through the Louisiana Purchase, are going to secure a trade corridor to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, building on the Louisiana Purchase, we have the Monroe Doctrine. Remember, that was the post-war of 1812, keeping Europe out of the Western Hemisphere, mainly anti-France and anti-Spain, countries that were trying to reassert itself uh, come the early 1820s. And also, we now have this idea, because after the scramble for Africa that the Europeans have done, uh, a lot of higher-ups in the government are going to believe that we are falling behind Europe and that we need to establish colonies just as the Europeans have done. And really, the main focus for the United States is the Pacific area for that. You can see here, Louisiana Purchase again, Manifest Destiny, that sea to shining sea, God told us to expand as far west as we could. Now, what's driving imperialism? There are three major things here. First thing, desire for military strength. Alfred Mahan is going to uh, tell the president, we need to expand the Navy if we're going to uh, follow through with this imperialist idea. We have a thirst for new markets. We have overproduction of our goods with the industrialization period that we're in. We are far out producing what we can consume for ourselves. And in addition to what we're producing, our raw materials are running low. So we have to uh, find these new markets for also raw materials to extract from them as well. Also, the belief in cultural and racial superiority. Uh, basically, what we're talking about here is social Darwinism, the survival of the fittest. Also, this cultural superiority, we. We also have the idea of uh, Christianizing savage people, uh, especially the Hawaiians and the uh, Filipinos at this point. And Hawaii and Alaska. Alaska is really the first major purchase in 1867 by our Secretary of State, William Seward. Uh, he's going to be made fun of really for, for following through with this purchase. It ends up being uh, costing the United States about two cents an acre uh, for Alaska. The joke's on everybody else because it is extremely rich in natural resources, and I'm sure you've watched all these TV shows now with gold and uh, everything else. It's the kind of the new final frontier. You can see here it's very close to Russia, and the natural resources are more in the interior, and the major population is going to be on the outside or the, the coastline area. Also, Hawaii, 1898, uh, a little bit later, uh, it has been a docking point to China and to the east and other countries there. Early on, we had sent missionaries there, and the descendants of those missionaries became sugar planters, and they're going to import some foreign labor, um, and they're going to become extremely rich. From 1875 to 1890, there's no tax on exporting sugar to the United States, and that's going to make these planters extremely, extremely rich. However, after 1890, things are going to change. There becomes talk of annexation to be part of the United States, and the sugar plantations are going to be the most wealthy uh, group in the entire islands. Uh, the United States itself, the government values the islands, uh, getting back to as early as 1887 and establishing a military base there at Pearl Harbor. So we know that they're a valuable commodity. By 1890, the uh, duty-free sugar is gone. William McKinley is going to implement a tariff, which is going to uh, implement very, very high rates of tax on these people. So, of course, these sugar planters, they don't want to have to pay this extremely high tax, so they want to become part of the United States because technically they're still foreign. Okay, So the planters want annexation. Grover Cleveland, the president at the time, he would agree to annexation if Hawaiians wanted it. If the Hawaiians voted for uh, annexation, then he would allow that to happen. However, uh, it doesn't end up going the way that they had planned, and Cleveland never does allow the annexation 
Uh, however, 1898, when William McKinley takes over the presidency, uh, Hawaii is going to become a territory. And there's a reading on E2SD called Hawaii, which is pretty interesting, kind of outlines the rebellion that happens there. Okay. Here's the queen, Queen Lilio Kalani. Uh, she's the one that gets basically uh, that has to abdicate her throne in, in favor of these uh, Americans that are going to come in and annex the islands. Here's some foreign labor. Uh, strangely enough, Portuguese labor and Japanese labor are the two major foreign uh, foreign labor sources, along with the Chinese. There. Here's another picture. Now Puerto Rico. The question of Puerto Rico is statehood or self-governance after the Spanish-American War. We want a uh, presence there in the Caribbean because we have an intent to build a canal in the very near future. Uh, in 1900, after the Spanish-American War, we're going to uh, pass the Four Acre Act, which is going to end military rule there in Puerto Rico and set up a civil government. Our president will appoint the governor there, and the people itself will only be able to vote on the lower house of the Congress. And by 1917, they're going to gain U.S. citizenship. Now, Cuba, on the other hand, Cuba is officially independent after the Spanish-American War, but is still occupied by our American troops. Jose Marti is that one of those rebels. He is going to make the case for the United States just replacing Spain, and really that's a lot of what happened. We, a lot of these very high officials, we don't even replace them. It's just we kind of exchange out Spain for us, the United States. The Teller Amendment is going to basically state that U.S. had no intention of taking over any part of Cuba. However, we still want a military presence there. But we did want to protect our, our business interests there. That is really important to us. More along the lines with Cuba here, the Platt Amendment and being a protectorate. The Platt Amendment is, in, is the United States insisting that amendments be made to the Cuban Constitution. Uh, amendments that include no treaties limiting their independence, uh, the amendment that the United States has the right to intervene at any time, that Cuba cannot go, any, go into any debt, and the United States can buy or lease any land for the Navy. Okay? And by 1903, the Platt Amendment is going to be adopted, and Cuba will become a protectorate, meaning that uh, they're going to be kind of like a little brother, and the United States is going to oversee what happens there in Cuba. Now moving on to the Philippines, also something else that we gained after the Spanish-American War. They're going to be known as the Little Brown Brother to the United States, and also it's going to serve as a gateway to China. They have a very similar situation to Cuba in that we are going to rule them. The United States is going to see these Filipino people as inferior, which is going to cause a rebellion. Uh, we're going to force them to live in designated zones, which have poor sanitation, starvation, and disease. Strangely enough, this is what just exactly happened with, this, with the Spanish in Cuba. We're going to do the same thing to these Filipino people. This is going to cause a Philippine-American war uh, led by Emilio Aguinaldo, and this is going to take three years to put down the rebellion. It cost us $20 million, which we paid to Spain, for the rights to the Philippines. It's going to cost us $400 million to keep it. Okay? Again, similar government uh, to set up to Puerto Rico. And given independence, July 4th, 1946. Okay, One little interesting fact is there was the development of a 45 caliber handgun during this time period to put down this rebellion. Now, China. China is seen as a potential market for American products. It is known as the sick man of Asia because they have been weakened by war over and over and over again. And now a lot of their country has been divvied up by European powers. The Open Door Notes is going to be written by John Hay, because he's going to see China as slowly being closed off to American trade. So what he's going to do is write this, uh, write this letter to these other imperial powers stating that we should share the trading rights to the United States and that no nation would end up having a monopoly there in China. The funny thing to think about, though, is would the United States have agreed to this had they been the first to be in China? Probably not. You can see here the sphere of influence. You can see France, Britain, Germany, Japan, and Russia all have carved certain areas of China uh, for their own taking and extraction. Now, the Chinese are not going to take very kindly to these foreign devils, as they like to call them. They want to get rid of all of, the, all of the foreigners from their country. The international forces that are going to be kind of fighting against these uh, Chinese are going to put down the rebellion pretty quickly. Two months later is all it takes after the uh, initial fighting begins. John Hay ends up writing a second Open Door Notes, which would state the United States would safeguard the world in the principle of equal and impartial trade. 
and really becomes there's three beliefs that become the foundation of our foreign policy the growth of economy depends on our exports we should have the right to intervene abroad to keep markets open and closing an area to the to american products to our citizens or ideas threaten our survival as a country which is pretty heavy stuff if you think about it so let's recap you should be able to describe three factors that fueled American imperialism, compare the governments of Puerto Rico and the Philippines, explain what it means for a country to be a protectorate, and understand why China was the sick man of Asia. That's all I have for today. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. If you have any questions, find me in class and let me know.